Hi everyone, welcome. I'm delighted to have you with us and really uh, delighted to kick this off. Uh, and now, um, my name's Jacob Reynolds. I'm joining today um, from Kiev in Ukraine to continue with the international theme, um, a city that actually I, I spent a, a, a little bit of my time in. So uh, delighted to be here from there. And I, I guess, I mean, by way of introduction, a few words uh, first about what we're doing today in terms of the this what we're calling the international salon so obviously over the past um uh, almost two years as we at the academy of ideas have moved a lot of our debates and discussions online we as you know an organization have championed the importance of being together um, with each other in the flesh um and have campaigned in various guises to try and uh, push back on some of the restrictions that have characterized uh, the past period but nonetheless, we're not too um, boneheaded to uh, forget that there have been some uh, really useful elements that do that have come out of the pandemic and the switch to various things online. And in our case, the thing that we do want to carry forward um, as we head out the pandemic is the fact that we've been able to join up with friends and colleagues, fellow thinkers um, from literally uh, around the world and that we've been able in these discussions to engage a really wide variety of people through that time and kind of think together about how this event, which really is a, a global event and the pandemic, um, how that has affected all of us and what we can learn from people's different experiences. So thus the idea of carrying on at least some Zoom events in the form of this, the International Salon, that, that's the idea um, underpinning what we're doing. We're really, really delighted to kind of kick this off and, and, and carry this on into the future. And today's topic obviously uh, lends itself both to an international discussion um, and also to the, 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 the fact that we're kind of on Zoom. So, I mean, given the kind of breadth of the restrictions that, have, that we've seen that have characterized ordinary life over the past couple of years, and given the way that lots of people are explicitly talking about using these restrictions or using that model of uh, overhauling society going forward as humanity faces so-called new and even more dangerous threats from climate change and all the rest of it. It's very important that we get to grips with um, one thing that has underpinned a lot of this discussion, which is the idea of fear, or as has been termed by many cultural commentators, the culture of fear. Um, now, many people, I mean, you, it, it's not a wholly original comment to say that fear can be uh, it's not for many people particularly motivating and it can lead to a sense of apathy and disaffection. Uh, and so to challenge the culture of fear in, in a sense is about reclaiming a sense of political agency and reclaiming a sense of political opportunity because um, you don't need to be Extinction Rebellion to think that there are some sort of major threats facing humanity at this stage and there are major political, economic, social and even environmental challenges that we face and that we do need to get a grip on. And the question is, well, how do we motivate people uh, to uh, join causes or uh, campaign and think together to overcome some of those threats? Fear, we might say, is not the answer. But at the same time, simply ignoring those threats under the guise of being fearless, maybe that's not wholly productive either, where I am at the moment in Kiev, I've enjoyed coming here a lot during the pandemic because in being the kind of uh, post-Soviet state that it is, there's a healthy sense of distrust and towards government regulations. And so it's felt at many times like a much freer uh, society than where I'm from in London. And so it's nice being here, but equally, if I'm honest with myself, a lot of that uh, sort of disregard of the restrictions is m better probably understood as a kind of apathy towards the possibility of change at all, rather than a kind of positive uh, reclaiming of the virtues of freedom and a kind of genuine challenge to the culture of fear. So we want to try and steer something of um, a path between those two alternatives, between sort of overhyping fear on the other hand and a blasé, Pollyanna-ish, it's all fine, um, and therefore who cares attitude on the other. Um, and to help us, I mean, to kick us off and to help us navigate our way through this, I'm delighted to introduce uh, a, a, a really great lineup. And in keeping with the theme of this being the International Salon, a genuinely kind of world, world, worldwide or at least international 
uh, series of speakers for you, which I'm, I'm really delighted. So I'll introduce them very quickly in the order that they speak. You, they speak. you can go on to the Academy of Ideas or the Battle of Ideas website, um, and you'll be able to find their, their longer biographies. I'll just give you uh, a, a brief taster right now. So speaking first is going to be Josie Appleton, who's the director of the Civil Liberties Group, the Manifesto Club. She's the author of a really great book that definitely helped and shaped a lot of my thinking as the pandemic and the response to the pandemic and lockdowns emerged, which is called Officious, The Rise of the Busy Busybody State. And she's also a blogger on notesonfreedom.com. And on the, a time where maybe I only get too much of my commentary from Twitter, it's really good. And Josie's blog has been over a, a few years now, a really good source of reflections and thoughts on everything from coronavirus to the trans issues and uh, lots in between. And so I do urge you to uh, make sure you add that to your um, list of websites that you frequent. So please do. So and a big warm welcome then to Josie. And then we'll be hearing um, from Alex Cameron, who's a graphic designer, a designer uh, and cultural critic, um, lectured also uh, uh, around the place. And I mean, joining us, I think, from, from Spain, definitely someone with uh, lots to add on this topic. I, I feel like we might be having a few issues with his internet so we'll kind of try and bear with that but we'll be hearing from Alex in a sec uh, then we'll be hearing from uh, Rosalind Fuller who's the managing director of the Solon Democracy Institute she's author um, of an important book in defense of democracy joining us at, at least if my memory is right joining us from Ireland but where Rosalind's been involved as those two parts of her biography would suggest in various kinds of public initiatives to get people rethinking what democracy means and uh, why it's important. And has been a sort of, uh, we were delighted uh, in a couple of years ago to have over for the Battle of Ideas and really delighted again to be joined by Rosalind tonight. And then last but by no means least is Matthew Kruger, who's an advocate at the uh, Johannesburg Bar. I think it's, I think he's just told me that he's, he's just qualified, he's now fully a qualified uh, bane of everyone's existence in the form of a lawyer. But, um, and uh, but more than that, he's been very prevalent, uh, must be said, a kind of somewhat lonely voice in South Africa arguing against um, the sort of huge reach of state power that, the, that it has, has uh, sort of emerged over the course of the pandemic and has been writing uh, some longer form pieces on that that I've found are really interesting and really useful reflections that are not at all just restricted to uh, the context of South Africa. So um, I'll, I'll stick a link in the chat to uh, some of his pieces, or you can go through and follow him on Twitter and all the rest of it. But again, really delighted to be joined by uh, Matthew. So in terms of how this has work, if you've ever been to one of our uh, debates on the lockdown, or if you've ever been with us in person before, uh, hopefully things will be pretty familiar. I'll get each of our speakers to introduce their sort of take on the topic for five or six minutes, and then we will go out to the audience. And as I say, this is a really a great opportunity for us to continue and deepen some of the links that we've been making across cultures and across countries and across continents uh, since the pandemic began. And hopefully <laughs> together we can throw uh, some different shades of light on this topic, which really does, as I say, have a very uh, international significance. And so that's why it's really good to discuss it in such a sort of international context. But that's enough for me. I think. So without uh, anything further, I'll hand over to Josie and your take. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I think kind of looking at our current situation in a historical perspective, there's not anything um, novel or necessarily problematic about having a pessimistic view of the future or an idea that things could get worse or they could be great crises. Um, I think one of the first ideas of historical time was really the idea of a golden age and descent from the golden age and everything getting worse every generation. Um, obviously had ideas of deluge and ideas of the apocalypse in Christianity and ancient Iranian religion. So very much these ideas of uh, an awareness that things are changing, that they're gonna be challenges, uh, maybe a great event or catastrophe after which um, humanity will be reborn. Um, and kind of reviewing these ideas at the end of the 20th century, Kishan Kumar said that the thing that characterized those times, our times, um, in terms of pessimism, um, was really the, the absence of any idea of a new beginning. So you had an idea of, of ending and of, of catastrophe, but without any idea of new beginning. Um, and so things uh, just sort of get worse and worse, like the lines on the graph. Um, and at some point, 
you know, they kind of fall off, but there's never any kind of great event. And the catastrophe is not really meaningful. So it's not really a battle of good and evil. It's sort of the accretion of, of indices. Um, so the COVID graph or the, the carbon dioxide graph is just sort of getting worse and worse into the future. But there's not really an event. And we're all sort of trying to stop the event from happening. Um, so I think there's kind of a particular kind of apolitical way in which society for the last 10 or 20 years has seen um, the future and seen kind of ideas of, of, of things getting worse or crisis. Um, I think specifically now, which has become clarified with climate change and COVID, is really the orientation of politics and society, the state in particular, around the threat and the government through the threat. You know, probably that began with, with climate change and, and terrorism but perfected with COVID. And, and so the threat becomes the logic for the orientation of, of the whole of government and the whole of the state. And everything is oriented towards dealing with this threat. And it's probably the, the only thing that can really unite the state behind a kind of common cause, um, you know, in the way that say a war would have done in the past, it, it sort of becomes the great unifying element. Um, and Ulrich Beck, the German uh, philosopher and, and green thinker, made a very interesting point about climate change where he said that this, um, he calls it a fixed star by which society could navigate. He said that this threat, even if it's not true, even if it doesn't happen, he said, we should respond to it because this is the only way we can give an orientation for politics and for social relations. And I think that was very interesting because what he was saying really is that politics and social relations can't be organized Society can't create its new organization out of itself. It can only do it in response to a threat in a sort of negative kind of manner. So it's, it, you can't um, create ideals or new social forms according to what people want to do, according to new political ideas that come out of society, but only in a kind of responsive kind of manner. And so it's a kind of a response to something coming from without and particularly a natural form from without and, and not um, a realization of political goals or realization of what people want to do in the here and now. So it's kind of a, a politics that's really the, the death of politics that, that means that politics is overridden and that policy becomes an expression of response to a natural threat um, and not the realization of what people want to do, how they want to live, or democratic accountability. Um, the Italian uh, philosopher Giorgio Agam Agam Agamemnon, I can never say his name, I don't, you probably said differently in Italian anyway. So he talks about the state of exception and the way in which increasingly, and it started actually in the, in the, in the w w wars, but it, increasingly the last 20 years, um, governments have worked um, through uh, responding to threats and creating a state of executive power. So they rule not through parliaments, but by decree. Um, and so essentially the, the government and policy and state making becomes a response to this threat. And as a result, it's, there's no time for talk. There's no time for discussion. There's no time for parliament to review the law. It has to be simply enacted. And obviously with COVID, this was taken to an extreme measure with uh, health secretary writing uh, law in England um, overnight. And it's becomes enacted before it's even published sometimes. Um, so you have, pure executive authority. Um, and the reason you can justify that is response to the threat. And so if you look at the kind of statutory uh, powers are brought through, it always says in response to this emergency and there's not time to lay before parliament, therefore we enact the following law. And it's the same in France, it's the same in most European countries. Um, and this has now become, become the norm. So political policy, is a, is a response to this threat and it's enacted against people. Um, and the content of these policies is not a revolution of how things are organized, but is in general cases, a generally as a general sort of social suppression. So if you look at the kind of content a lot of the lockdown policies did very little to target moments of infection, but were really targeting people's movements, so you can't move more than one kilometer from your house, you can't, um, you can't go for a walk in the park, you can't lie in the park, you can't go for a walk in the countryside. Now these actions didn't actually transmit COVID, but it was this sort of general social suppression that was the answer to this threat. So I think that's, that was also the case with a lot of terrorist restrictions, you know, just a general social suppression. 
And so what you have is a, a logic of policy making, which just is a general restriction brought in response to a threat. And that becomes the dynamic, dynamic of political life, what political life is about, um, rather than you know, expressing what, what people want, how they want to live. Um, and I think that this dynamic of political control actually obscures possible solutions to problems. I mean, I think that it, you know, COVID policy has been immensely ineffective. Climate change policy is immensely ineffective because they're essentially about this logic of suppression and not about um, a, a revolutionizing of how we're doing things that actually improve people's lives. Um, so I think that the state is using these problems as a means of reorganization, which at the same time is obstructing any useful solution to the problems, as well as creating a tremendous suppression of civic life and a suspension of democracy. Great, Th thanks for that, Josie. V very helpful um, introductions. That was great. I'll um, I'll do the spotlighting thing, and then I'll uh, hand over to Alex. So, Alex, over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, in this five minutes, I want to introduce um, uh, the privatisation of fear, the problem of the privatisation of fear. Um, and I've kind of titled it, We Are All Agoraphobics Now. Um, I think a lot of people here, um, people who attend um, Academy of Ideas events, will be familiar with the concept that the pandemic has accelerated already existing trends. And I think in this instance, um, it can't be overemphasized. It's a really important um, framework to look at um, where we're at um, at the moment. So the trend, if you like, that I kind of want to uh, talk about, or I've been thinking about a lot, um, is the the de degradation, destruction, collapse, the ebbing away um, of the institutions and networks of collectivity and solidarity. Um, they were important because they offered, to a massive degree, a form of protection against the worst excesses of um, political life or the worst excesses of um, political um, attack. Um, and the kind of over a long post-war period in the UK certainly, um, the kind of ebbing away um, of collective networks um, increasingly, or perhaps decreasingly, left ordinary people defenseless. So as a kind of wee illustration of, of, of what I mean, if, as we undoubtedly all did during the lockdown, went a little bit crazy and came up with kind of crazy ideas, they were tempered when we stepped back at, into ordinary life. That's, <laughs> I'm making light of it, but when you take your crazy ideas to the pub or the cafe, you know, your friends are quick to um, calm you down and are quick to challenge um, the worst excesses um, of your crazy ideas. And I think on a grander scale, what institutions are solidarity, everything from a political party to a trade union to a social club, um, tempered the individual's worst fears and gave a sense of both defence, but also, in its best, um, the, a sense of, of possibilities. Now, I'm based in Madrid these days, and an interesting thing might be um, to ask the question whether the contrast between somewhere like Spain and the UK in terms of how we got here, how this process worked itself through, whether that's important or not, in, in, in terms of how one might intervene um, in political life. So where in the UK, I would, you know, um, for the moment, um, term it as the 
a long process of the ebbing away of collective uh, uh, institutions. In Spain, it was brutal, devastating, destructive, and uh, over a relatively um, relatively short um, space of time. Although in saying that, within touching distance, even up to the 80s in Spain, um, people recognised that to be political is an extremely dangerous game. To belong to such institutions was a really dangerous game. It could literally mean your life. So is it any wonder that Spaniards turned to the family, the home, effectively, um, to express um, their own interests. So the two are very, very different, but yet we've managed to arrive at the same place. And that is, uh, whether you want to call it the working class, the public, um, right-thinking people, we have been absolutely left defenseless, defenseless. And is it any wonder then that people feel terror in their own homes and are worried um, about the everyday um, uh, uh, and fear going out, uh, never mind getting involved in politics. So the public, I think this is a, it's not the only issue, but it's a crucial issue if we want to answer the question posed. Uh, you know, an atomized and defenseless public um, is a difficult um, uh, place to get out of. So the answer is easy. How we manage it is another matter, but we certainly need new forms and new networks of solidarity um, and commonality. Um, how we get there, as I say, is another matter. But to go back to my earlier title, certainly we need to get out more. Thank you. Thanks, um, Alex. Uh, thanks a lot. I've found myself a lot, a lot in these the Zoom conversations in the kind of paradoxical position of arguing for something that we're not, lit we're literally not right now practicing. And that's a helpful illustration of why, um, well, depending what time it is, but you can go out to the pub after the uh, uh, after tonight. But um, anyway, uh, the, the, let's keep things moving. Thanks a lot, uh, Alex. Let's uh, hand over to Ross then. So thanks. I want to zero in on the word apocalyptic today. So why is there so much apocalyptic thinking as opposed to concerned or worried or risk averse thinking? Well, an apocalypse has two factors. One is its all encompassing nature. So caution, fear, anxiety, these are all generated by contemplating that you're going to end. When I'm risk averse, I'm trying to avoid me ending. An apocalypse is thinking that the world is going to end. So not just you, everything. And the second characteristic of an apocalypse is that it's a revelation. In an apocalypse, the truth will be revealed about who's good and who's bad and who's right and who's wrong. An apocalypse is a balance sheet on the era that it ends. And I can see how this is a very attractive proposition to many people in our time, because there's a complex of factors that's led to it. We could think about the narcissistic injury of being average in a world that condemns averageness, the always on media that can always provide a disaster somewhere, and the necessity to wildly exaggerate to get any attention at all. These are all true, but I'll briefly address just three considerations that I think are the most important, the political, the psychological, and the economic. So first, the political. Because our political system is winner takes all, each side continuously ups the stakes in their attempt to win power. And social institutions, like education or the media, become subordinated to this power struggle and essentially looted for their social capital in the quest to attain or retain power. So for example, universities stop judging ideas on intellectual merit, thus negating the purpose they were built for. Media is overtly partisan, again, negating the purpose it was created for. People's standard of living bears little relationship to their effort, negating the purpose of work. And billionaires and corporations evade tax, negating the purpose of a state. So this tendency of electoral systems to increasing political warfare was the subject of my first book. But because it's so destructive, it often has to be rhetorically justified. 
Obviously, that favors apocalyptic rhetoric. People are going to die if you don't get this policy through. So it's good that you twisted the truth of it. Unfortunately, destroying so much social capital in itself creates a nihilistic force at the center of society, which works to self-actualize the very apocalyptic situation that was used to justify taking such action in the first place. It's kind of a political perpetual mobile. And I think it gives people a justified sense of impending doom, despite being a purely man-made problem. This political warfare is both a product and reinforcer of the second factor, swiftly increasing economic inequality, or to put it in psychological terms, humiliating injustice. There are two main classes of people here, the victims and the beneficiaries of this economic injustice, and both of them have a strong psychological interest in apocalyptic thinking. The victims are probably never gonna get anywhere in life. So obviously from their perspective, there's little to lose by burning it all down. A great reckoning would actually be in their interests. But even more apocalyptic in their attitude are the winners, the upper middle class. They know that they've hoarded the gains of free trade and increased productivity for themselves and that they haven't been quite fair to everyone else. We use the word scapegoat a lot today, but few people are aware that scapegoats were once literally goats, that the society would load its sins on and then send off into the wild. Today's upper middle class attempts a kind of ad hoc version of this, casting a boat for scapegoats to blame for anger towards them. Is it racist? Is it transphobia? Is it ignorance? It's actually their overvalued houses that their kid whose university tuition they paid for and whose first job they arranged on a handshake is going to inherit, while the rest of us do their work while living in a cubbyhole that they try to convince us we actually really like because it's good for the environment. No one except themselves, and they are a minority, buys their scapegoating attempts. So they do something that is characteristically almost clever. That is to punish themselves on their own terms. And they do this by pouring emotion into being performatively apocalyptic. Religion exists all over the world. It gives life meaning and provides justice, whereby the apocalypse, the great revelation, is the final, inexorable, and therefore most meaningful justice. So one side wants justice, the other side wants the appearance of it. But since we badly damaged the social institutions that once provided it, this energy has been poured into trying to out-apocalypse each other. The final big thing, money. Panic is a great way to get people to agree to anything. Fear is the mind killer. Two sets of people have started using this as a constant tactic. One are the people who don't trust others with relatively straightforward truths and assume they can only be motivated to take sensible action via abject fear. Then there's a second, often smarter and richer group, that uses apocalypticism as a way to avoid scrutiny. So when someone says, hey, why are we giving this huge contract to this private company for some environmental project? They'll scream that you're a climate denier who's funded by the Koch brothers and wants to kill every being on planet Earth. So apocalyptic thinking serves to justify things that are unjustifiable. The complement of apocalypticism is not pragmatic action, it's salvation. Only a savior can save you from the apocalypse. So faith, rather than thinking, becomes the important point. People usually look for this third factor, the money, and it's an important factor, but I wouldn't underestimate the impact of the psychological and quasi-religious factors here too, as this is what keeps apocalyptic thinking running on its own steam once it's started. Thanks. Great, Rosalind, uh, brilliant. Um, all, all, always really good to hear from you, and that was, that was no exemption, but thanks so much. I'll, I'll pass over to... Uh, Matt, and then we'll be coming out for questions. So get ready uh, for questions and comments. But uh, Matthew. Uh, sorry, I just want to turn myself off my uh, self view uh, to get out, to get out of the way. <laughs> ah, very good. Um, thank you. Um, in the spring of 1956, uh, Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer had a month long conversation that was meant to form the basis of a contemporary communist manifesto. Adorno's wife, Greta, sat as their secretary, and the product of this conversation and Greta's note-taking was a little pamphlet titled Towards a New Manifesto. Near the start of their conversation, Adorno expresses an idea that contains the essence of the pamphlet they were seeking to supplant. 
affirming Marx, he says, the possibility of a completely unshackled reality remains valid. But about three weeks later, Adorno's negativity reveals itself. He says, we do not live in a revolutionary situation and actually things are worse than ever. The horror is that for the first time we live in a world in which we can no longer imagine a better one. What is this thought other than Thatcher's higher conspired, there is no alternative, albeit expressed by a melancholic Marxist. As the blurb to the session rightly points out, there is a fatalism that underlies this kind of thinking, which manifests in the apocalyptic discourse ranging from climate change to COVID, where what matters most is keeping people alive. As presciently described by Lash, it is a culture of survivalism. South Africa is no exception. In April last year, our president said this, we are now in a war, we're in a war zone, and our rights will inadvertently be affected and restricted for our own survival. The same rhetoric was found amongst our media and commentators who spoke of COVID as a tsunami that might engulf and destroy us all, or proclaim that government's first duty is to keep us alive. The blurb suggests or implies at least that the alternative to this fatalism is a positive reassertion of our capacity to, if not quite become unshackled from nature's yoke, then at least to push back at its limits. But here I disagree. For here, I think, is exactly the problem that lies at the root of our present situation. The problem with utopian and quasi-utopian visions is that they always disappoint. After utopia, as Judith Schlar put it, nihilism or fatalism follows. With this, radicalism dies too. If you can no longer imagine a better world, what's the point? And worse still, from the ashes of lost faith, there rises a vision of life that is defined by the very thing that the utopians sought to overcome. For if we cannot unshackle reality, life becomes an essentially shackled one. On this view of things, all that is not chosen is experienced as an imposition, a form of violence on the self, a vision found in theorists like Judith Butler and her undergraduate acolytes. With this, what emerges as our most important value is a prolongation of a minimally tolerable life, which is to say a life fixated on minimizing pain and death, a life managed by the pursuit and construction of safe spaces, the steady enlargement of which brings not a sense of security, but only a crippling apocalyptic anxiety. If gratuitous optimism tends towards apocalyptic fatalism, does this mean that we will inevitably swing back and forth between the two? Is there no alternative to freedom and survival? There is an alternative, but it seems to me that to see it from hand and Marx, Adorno, and Butler on the other, it requires our thinking about the present and the future other than through the twin poles of unshackled reality and violent constraint, which is to say other than through freedom. There is another strand of our tradition which is not structured by these abstract concepts, but by the more mundane things we find important, like family, love, play, spontaneity, artworks, belonging. In this tradition, what matters is not whether we, whether we are unshackled or bound, at least not directly so. What matters is spending time with people whom we love, going to the theater or the football or the pub, fleeting moments in which we can be carefree, and all those many daily activities that often lie beneath the horizons of our great philosophers. True, this vision does not tend towards, does not lend itself towards manifestos or politicians beating their desks with books or sassy Swedes saying blah, blah, blah to the camera. But what lockdown revealed to us is that these are the things that really matter. It is not so much being deprived of freedom, whatever that might mean in the end, that matters, than it is our not being able to visit our family and friends, attend funerals and weddings, watch our sports teams play live. Or if we want to stress freedom, it is the denial by those with power that these things matter, and therefore the restriction of our right to disagree and to argue for different policies. South Africa's constitution is structured by this alternative vision. It talks about realizing unity and diversity, where diversity is not the superficial kind mouthed by HR managers and government bureaucrats, but rather the diversity of goodness, of those things given to us and those things that we have chosen, which structure our daily lives. Despite this, however, our South Africa's elites betrayed this vision in the face of COVID. They enlisted in the president's war on the virus. Maybe their abandonment of constitutional principle reveals that ideals are easily trumped by fear, or maybe it tells us that they never really held true to these ideals at all. Whatever the reason, though, 
if we are to overcome these fatalists, these doom mongers, these nihilists and misanthropes, it will not be by turning their ideas upside down. Empty optimism, abstract talk of freedom and sovereignty and humanity will not help us. It will always only make matters worse. It is only by deflating our talk and returning to the mundane, ordinary things that make life meaningful that we might have a chance of not just imagining, but also living in a better world. Thanks. Great. Thanks a lot, uh, Matt. And uh, thanks a lot to all of um, all four speakers for some really brilliant and thought provoking uh, introductions. It does at least show that even if we can't be together in person, we can have a conversation that is uh, just as stimulating as it might be uh, being in, in the room, or at least thus far, because now uh, comes the time to kind of open things up to the audience. There's a lot that uh, I could pick up on already, but that certainly in the spirit of this being uh, a, a public or at least a, a quasi-public conversation, I want to open that up. So many of you, if you're logging back into Zoom after um, a little while away from it, having been enjoying uh, time down the pub or, or, or outside or wherever, you might notice that at least some of the buttons have changed. You might be struggling to locate the raise hand function, uh, but it does live mostly now for most of you in the reactions uh, thing, which is at the bottom of your screen. So um, do find that, stick your hands up, and we'll get a, a conversation going. And I'm really excited to hear from some of you, not least because there's so much to dig into in what we've heard from our speakers. So uh, who, who, who would like to kick us off? A very, very rare thing for uh, of one of our events, which shows that people are out of practice using Zoom. Anyway, uh, so let's go off first to Phil Hammond. Thanks, Jacob. Um, really interesting, um, thought-provoking introduction. So I wanted to pick up on uh, what what Josie said about Ulrich Beck and the the risk society idea being a risk being a kind of substitute really for a kind of absent political vision um, and providing a kind of negative imperative to act. One of the things that it also does is provides um, elites, political elite, governing elites, who are the people acting with a kind of um, a way to act, but not, not assume any responsibility for the decision that they, they might take, that they, you know, it's a kind of, there is no alternative type vision, but it, you can also see it, I think, writ large in, in environmentalism, um, that we have to do this, we, this is the policy, we have to act or follow the science. So no one is kind of responsible for the act, it's another kind of um, attraction of it uh, for the elite. What I'm going to ask in, in light of that is, given that we've seen um, over the last few years, the rise of, um, new forms of populist politics, which in some cases at least, um, Brexit is at the forefront of my mind here, um, does seem to um, want to hold politicians to account for their policies and actions. Is there a sense in which you could look to that as providing a kind of, I don't know, a seedbed for, for, for change in that? in that regard, how, how do you see that? And I, I, same question really also to Alex and whether you would see these new forms of populist politics as a kind of starting point for new forms of, of social solidarity in the way that you called for. Great, thanks a lot, Phil. Uh, Richard, over to you, do unmute yourself and uh, turn your camera. Yeah, unfortunately you'll have to just look at my beautiful face. It's even more beautiful in reality, but my camera isn't working. So sorry about that. Um, I want to suggest something. I'm not sure if I'm going to agree with um, Matthew or not, because I, uh, I was slightly having difficulty following him, but that's not his fault. That's my fault. Uh, because it's interesting that he mentioned Adorno. I think perhaps in the sort of secular world, one of the uh, early origins of there is no alternative has been uh, the socialist imperative. Uh, uh, unless there's a workers' revolution, uh, the worker is doomed. Um, and, and in a sense, what Thatcher managed to do is kind of turn that on its head uh, by saying that, that capitalism uh, is the only uh, solution to our problems. And it's obviously the absence of the contestation between those two apocalyptic views of the world that have uh, the absence of that now has led us down a slightly different path. But I think what's even perhaps even more interesting is that uh, whereas before one might have argued that it's fear of the masses uh, that has driven uh, policy and politics, uh, I think 
what we have now is a, is, a, is a sort of flip of that situation where it's actually the fear of the individual or as he or she or they or whatever is now known uh, the conspiracy theorist uh, that is the biggest uh, threat to everyone's freedom, to all our freedoms together. So, so I'm, I'm wondering how far uh, any of the people uh, would agree that the, the real problem that we have uh, today uh, is, not, uh, is no longer, in fact, uh, the fear of uh, mass uprisings, uh, but the fear of the, uh, the isolated individual uh, and what he might do. Thanks a lot, uh, Richard. And uh, so Barry, who said on the chat that he wanted to speak, uh, do turn your camera on and we'll... Thank you. Um, I see things quite a lot differently to uh, all the speakers, and it's just comments uh, on climate change. Um, you can't be progressive if you have the assumption that unites uh, the website spikes, that there is no alternative to capitalism. And it's worse than that. They can fake capitalism with humanity in general, uh, the clear fact is that all the classes, from the proles, the middle class, the churches, heck, even the monarchy, are delightfully uniting in a condemnation of the capitalist class. Prince Harry has said we need a Greta Thunberg in every town and city. Now, rather than look at these new passions and look at the potential, the problem is in we are producing, indeed in commodities themselves. They are actually, in practice, deepening Marx's concept of species being, which is the precondition for an improved relationship with nature, which we should love and adore. Brendan O'Neill calls all this batshit crazy, and it's really not on. There is a way to achieve net zero and, achieve, and feed the world and give them health care. A new society founded on species being could do away with greenhouse gas emitting sectors, such as advertising law, fashion, psychiatric medication, mineral water, and develop a mix of renewable energy and nuclear to clean everything else up. If instead you are wedded to only one model of economic progress, you are going to fuck up the planet even more than it already is. If every nation state is to have its own industrial revolution lasting 200 years, we will be living in reinforced plastic bubbles underwater in the future or in glass domes on a destroyed rock. Is that really what you want? If so, you are batshit crazy. Finally, James Hartfield says capitalism has gone green, but that's a lie. If you look at 2021, greenhouse gas emissions are rising 4.6%, their second highest rise in history, the biggest being in 2010. Capitalism cannot go green because it needs growth and a law of value inhibits expansion of renewables. The practice of the new social unity is questioning all that. Reactionary contemplative materialism is the enemy of a two-way relationship between theory and practice, but the practice side is already there. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. It would have been even better if, if we could have seen you, um, but well, the, we, we got your forthright point nonetheless. I'm, look, I'm sure there's some hands to come back, but th this is probably a good opportunity then to kind of quickly quick fire through the panel and get some thoughts and reactions to the kind of couple of points that we've had. So, I mean, uh, Josie, first over to you. Do you want to pick up anything or, and of course pick up on some of the points made by the other speakers? Um, sure, yeah. I mean, on the question of Populism, I mean, right now, European capitals are full of people in the streets protesting against vaccine passports and sort of demos that really you know, haven't been seen for a very long time. And I think that this is exactly what we need, but it, it, it dies out very quickly. I mean, in France, we had very demo, big demos when they announced the vaccine passports to start with. And really now they kind of dwindle every, every week. Um, so I, mean, I think that the trouble with populism is that it hasn't formed an organized force in terms of the way that um, Alex was talking about in terms of forming into a collective and it's a sort of pop it's a kind of collective outburst but doesn't become um, organized and therefore is easily overridden. I mean the, the ease with which people were locked up in their homes was astonishing and I think that just shows the absolute weakness of the collective. Um, um, on um, Barry's point about, um, I mean, I, I agree with part of it in the sense that uh, 
there is something fundamentally anarchic about the way that capitalism organizes the use of resources and production and the decisions that are made from the point of view of business are not the decisions that are necessarily in the collective human interest. The question is how do you enact that collective human interest or species being or whatever, whatever it is. Um, and that can't be done by the state. Um, and it, it can't be done by some kind of benign administrator or philosopher or whatever. So, I mean, again, the, the, the problem is there's no social force that, that, that could organize to decide what collectively is in the interest of humanity. Um, so the point at which you might actually decide to um, change the temperature or, you know, how we inhabit planet Earth collectively as a species, how would we decide to manage that, that world in our interests? I mean, and how would you decide to, to create energy? I mean, and I think that the, 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 essentially those questions are in the hands of bureaucracies right now. They're not in the hands of any kind of genuine human species formed politically. And that, that's, that's the kind of problem. And that's why all the policies take the form of suppression rather than revolution or rather than you know even something like nuclear power which has been around for decades is relatively ignored in terms of solutions so um i mean i think i think that is the same problem which is you don't you don't have that social formation that could act on behalf of humanity to solve those problems i mean i also agree with barry about the 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 the, the coexistence of um the, the green stuff can often be quite gestural i mean the whole kind of carbon market thing um, it's obviously uh, very gestural and a, almost like a means by which capitalism can continue with business as usual. Um, so, you know, and, and very kind of corrupt practices and everyone kind of recognizes it's a bit of a racket. So it's a kind of, it's kind of like a payoff on it, like an indulgence where you kind of go and sin, but you just pay off your, you know, carbon market, whatever. And therefore you can carry on doing sure. what you're doing. So I think, so I, I think that, um, yeah, so I'll stop there, sorry. Yeah, no, th thanks, Josie. Uh, Alex, you want to pick up on a couple of things? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, just to respond to batshit crazy Barry, um, if nothing else, Barry, I think you do one thing very well, and that is that you uh, highlight the tension between the ideological rush towards um, greenery by the political elite um, and the idea that they should or used to represent the idea of growth. So I, I, I certainly wouldn't um, um, plump one way or the other. They're only for growth. They're only for green. But there is a tension there for sure. Um, and that we can see that it's demonstrable um, by virtue of the fact that we just had um, COP26 <laughs> in Glasgow. Um, so I thought, Barry, you know, uh, it is that. It's a tension, but um, I don't think we can rule either uh, direction out. Um, Phil Harmon asked about um, new forms of um, social solidarity or networks of social solidarity, and I think Josie kind of uh, dealt with it a bit, in the, well, dealt with it, sorry, um, in that, um, we, we can see demonstrations, huge demonstrations, my T-shirt being one of them, through Europe, reacting against an instinctive sense that this is problematic for me and people like me. But look how quickly they're repressed and look how quickly they're demonised. And I think, to go, <laughs> excuse me, to go back to one of my points, I think that can only happen in a time when the networks are fragile rather than um, something more robust um, throughout society. Thanks a lot, Alex. Uh, Roslyn, a couple of quick thoughts. Yeah, um, I, I'd like to talk about a point that was originally raised by Josie and then one of the questioners brought it up as well. Um, and that's the sense of like a unifying force in society and that we're kind of lacking that. Um, we do live in a somewhat unique time in that for most of human history, that unifying force has been a threat. Like if you look at all historical societies, their main purpose has been 
to protect and provide security for their people against all kinds of threats. So we do live in a very unique time in that our generation and our parents' generation are almost like the first people who've ever lived who really don't worry about warfare as a constant threat and have a very long life expectancy. And I think that does change it and does kind of leave us flapping a little bit at a loose end. Like what is the meaning of life more so than in the past? I think there are lots of things that could provide us with a unifying force in society. We could explore space. I mean, there's lots of great things that are being done uh, in biology and in research. We could chain kind of, I suppose, our aggression into these things and to solve these issues and to do something really interesting. Um, but we're kind of not. And I think that's to some extent also why um, our governments have so been focused on these really quite, you know, not very significant threats, like, I mean, terrorism or coronavirus or things like this. I mean, although they're significant in a broader sense, like they're they're not quite the same as, you know, the Second World War or something and the impact they're going to have on people's lives. Um, so they're kind of trying to cast around for that, but not really hitting on something that's channeling people's energy that way. Um, and to, to Brennan, like Barry's point, he was talking about less growth. Yeah, well, that's another challenge we have because, the birth rate in Western countries has been below replacement levels since like the mid 70s. Uh, the birth rate in India isn't even that high above replacement levels anymore. So what's going to happen is the population is going to continue to increase. And then around the middle of the century, it's going to nosedive uh, if things go on the way they are. So we're all going to get to experience like less and less and less and less and less growth at that point. Um, and I don't think I don't think we really have an answer for that either, because, again, for like as long as we have records going back, society has been based on this like constant growth model where you have more children and they support you in old age and that's how we've been running things for so long so those are like two huge challenges actually that we need to solve um sometime during our lifetimes i guess great thanks Rosalind. We'll, we'll make a start on solving them tonight i'm sure uh matt uh, uh, some quick thoughts and we'll go back out yeah i think i'll be quite brief and i think a term that's come up quite often in a lot of the questions and a lot of the other speakers uh, speeches was the idea of or the need for some kind of new forms. So whether it's populism as a new form of uh, or mode of governance or whether we're in a particular new uh, period of history of the isolated individual or whether we need some new alternative to capitalism. What the common thread that uh, connects all these different ideas, and it's something that, and I apologize, Richard, for not being sufficiently clear in, in, in my speech, but it's the common idea that connects all this, I think is, that we need somehow to imagine some, some kind of future that is ultimately wholly different to what we're living in the present or anything we've experienced in the past. And that is something that I, I don't find terribly persuasive and I think needs a lot of work to make persuasive. Um, the history of like political theory and political philosophy are efforts by extraordinary thinkers precisely to construct these new forms. And it's precisely out of this effort to make something entirely new and to make something clean and pure that I think ultimately and inevitably tends towards a narrowing of vision. So rather than try to understand our prevailing forms in which we operate and how those, seek, uh, those function to fulfill different ends and different purposes, we try to imagine some grand perfect system that can resolve all our problems, some unifying force some grand new challenge in space, some populist uprising that can fix everything, some way to overcome our alienation, some new alternative to capitalism. But why, why do we imagine that the problems that we face require these uh, entirely new uh, schemes or forms to resolve them? Why, why don't existing systems that we have, existing forms of relation, those function to deal with the problems that we currently have? And it's precisely this belief, I think, or this, uh, this presumption that the way to overcome our problems in the present is to imagine something entirely new in the future that I think generates this cycle, this apocalyptic cycle, the swing between uh, uh, perfection and, 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 and apocalypse. Thanks, Matt. That's very helpful. Um, okay, let's, let's come back out. So we've got uh, at least four hands up. So um, who's down as Tom Flynn? Yeah, cheers. That's it. It's Rosie, not Tom. Yes, grand. Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, sort of unpick the thing about the the taking your crazy ideas to the pub 
and what Richard mentioned um, about the, the sort of fear of the crazed individual. When uh, last year, when we were discussing some of this, how do we get back out there and defeat the, the sort of fear that's prevailing? Just the general idea was you just just do it, just just lead, go out without your mask on, go back to the office. Um, very ordinary sort of challenges to um, to that sort of apocalyptic sort of narrative, just to go back and be ordinary um, and thereby sort of encourage others to do the same. Um, and, and I think I think that has worked to an extent. Um, and you can see that things are getting back to normal. People are socialising again um, where they can, obviously. I'm talking about England. Um, but at the same time, there's this, there is a sense, for me at least, you know, about whether the people that you're now associating with, whether there is a possibility to, to do anything more than than that at the moment. I think we've had such a, I mean, COVID added to it hugely, but we've had such a run of this um, erosion of um, political um, action. Um, we've had such a, a, a lot of um, atomizing kind of apocalyptic um, thinking going on for so long. And, uh, and I think we've got a, a heck of a long way back to go. Um, and I don't think that the crazy people have got down the pub enough um, to get rid of some of their extreme ideas. And a lot of what might look good in terms of the, the protests um, that are happening, I think one of the reasons why they... Uh, yes, they are repressed, but I think one of the things is that they're not going out there with anything coherent enough or tried and tested in the pub enough. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, it's what my colleague Mo Lovett has referred to a few times as things passing the pub test, which is a nice way, I think, of, of looking at it. Um, okay, uh, Jeff. No, I was just a bit concerned at the beginning that some of the speakers were, or came across as, I know we're discussing doom and apocalyptic thinking, but it's just almost a bit too apocalyptic. And it's certainly the case, as Rosalind very well put across, the, the extreme risk aversion we have at the moment on a number of issues. And I know Lord Sumption wrote in the press, British press today, about the cavalier way that leaders around Europe are just getting rid of people's rights as if it doesn't mean anything. Uh, you know, hard-won rights over centuries are just disregarded because uh, uh, COVID infections have sort of gone up very slightly or something like that. So there's a real problem, as people have said. But I do think two things. I think Jacob's throwaway point about going to the pub and going shopping, and as Rosie just said, I mean, those things are important. And certainly in England and in London now, like what we consider normal life has largely, I, I can't speak around the rest of Europe or the rest of the world, but certainly in London, it's largely come back with some limitations yes quite a few people still work from home some people don't venture out in central london like they used to but normally the pubs are largely full the shops are packed before christmas football crowds have come back on mass and it's like they never went away in one way and there's christmas shopping just before this meeting there were people who were pro lockdown people on the television exasperated about christmas and people having Christmas, and what could you do about it? And there's nothing you can do about it, because people want to have Christmas, and they will have Christmas in some form this year. Uh, and that, that's so something in and of itself. And people are very consciously organising, as this person exasperatedly said, people are organising big Christmases together with all their families, because they didn't have it last year. And to me, that's a good life-affirming sign. Also, in relate, finally, in relation to the protests yes the protests are limited and in some places you know the, you know things fade away but i do think that the legacy you know the brexit vote was five years ago very you know the various other things happened around the world 
you know, 2016 or 2017 or whatever. But I think that still, certainly in the UK and, and in England in particular, the legacy of these things still count for something and people do not automatically follow on every issue what people in authority tell them and see, you know, have quite a lot of resistance for them. And this is a Battle of Ideas satellite debate. We organised a Battle of Ideas festival where lots and lots of people who'd never been to events like that before had ideas which were counter that they wanted to discuss, that they wanted to engage with with other people and find ways of, uh, uh, of pushing back on a lot of things that were happening. So, yes, there is a very difficult situation in many places, but I also think there's a lot of potential uh, uh, for doing things to, to push back against it. Yeah, thanks for that, Jeff. There, there was echoed a lot, actually, in the Academy of Ideas office. We've been discussing the in the UK, there's been a minor storm around the advert produced by Tesco's, the big retailer in which there's all these people trying to celebrate Christmas together. And at one point in the advert, Santa gets stopped at the um, border control because he's misplaced his vaccine passport. And this resulted in a huge avalanche of complaints from uh, various people opposed to vaccine passports, which, I mean, are these one person in the office is making the point that that just misses the point of the advert. It's not about the existence of vaccine passports. The advert is about the fact that everybody wants to get back together again. And the, the, the kind of curmudgeonliness on both sides of the debate, both those trying to cancel Christmas and those trying to seize any opportunity to show that life's never going to go back to normal. Um, but okay, Alistair. Yeah, I'm sorry to the speakers and especially Josie, because I came in a little bit late and missed uh, what, most of what you said, Josie. But uh, the point at which I did come in, you were talking about the way that the state was using the, the crisis as a, as a kind of means of reorganisation. And I, I, I wanted to ask a question about that um, and the extent to which there's, there's a kind of conscious effort uh, in, in, in that respect, because... Uh, uh, you also, actually, it was Rosalind who, who talked about the way that apocaly apocalypticism, I can't say it as well as you, Rosalind, um, ups the stakes, stakes in an attempt to, to retain power. You talked about the way that the middle class were winners in this process. And that does seem to endow it with a level of, if not thought throughness, then at least a kind of semi-consciousness that there's something in this for them. And Richard, in, in his contribution, talked about the way that the, the, the state kind of organised itself around the fear of conspiracy theories. But I, I, I worry, in a sense, that we're endowing some of the things that are going on just now with a level of um, coherence that's, that's not quite there. So I, I, I wanted to, uh, if the speakers could reflect on that a little bit, and especially if in the course of the 18 months of or and more now of this pandemic whether we have given what's gone on in in austria and germany and i, I suppose for longer in france um has there been a shift across the course of the 18 months in in terms of something that perhaps uh, we just you know was responded to on a, on a kind of gut level on on a, on a fearful level has that now become something that's consolidated into something a bit more conscious in terms of reorganization or is this still the kind of blundering state that we've uh, known for a while? And after all, we live in a country where Peppa Pig has become a, uh, a you know, a, a point of conversation in the past uh, few days, uh, a, a country that can't build a couple hundred uh, miles of railway track. Uh, you know, it seems like a kind of fairly hopeless situation rather than anybody's in, in control of anything. Great, thanks, Alistair. Uh, over to Bev, it'd be great if you could turn your camera on. I, uh, yeah, um, I mean, our, um, my company is having a Christmas party, so it all seems quite normal, um, but we have to wear um, armbands uh, to say whether we agree with having, um, you know, social distancing, if we want a social distance, it's a red one. If we're kind of quite happy to fist pump, it's a green one. And if we are, anything goes, then we wear a yellow one. Um, so, you know, it might seem normal, but it, it's a sort of bad tempered, miserable normal um, when it comes to the kind of official places like work. Um, I agree with Jeff, you know, pubs are, are sometimes back to normal, but work is, is very difficult. And that is the place where you meet all sorts of people. And that's where you, um, 
you know, you have the potential for a bit of solidarity with people who are having the same problems as you. So just to, to Alex and, and a bit of Matt really in terms of um, his thinking. Um, I just can't believe, how do, how do we create solidarity? Because it seems to me, we've been through some really awful moments for the human condition, you know, through lockdown, you know, we saw people at funerals who had to sit on their own. And if, if someone tried to comfort them, they were pushed away because people had to social distance. People died on their own in hospital. Children went without schools. Um, people, you know, were locked in. People with mental health illnesses, you know, were left inside. Lonely people, all those sort of things that you think, my God, if anything's gonna unite the human race, this is, but it doesn't, it actually tears people apart because you, you can see that there are so many people who say, my God, you know, what are you talking about vaccine passports for? We need safety, we need to look after people, you lot are selfish. And there's been this real thing about the selfish individuals and Unheard has a really good article looking at the left today and the fact that, you know, there's been no one in the left really pushing for that. But, I wondered, you know, can we, what, is solidarity ever created through the moral prism? Because it seems to me that this was the perfect moment to create some form of solidarity, but it, it just couldn't happen. Great, thanks. I'm, I'm thinking there's uh, quite a lot came up in those few questions. I'm thinking maybe we'll, we'll come back um, to our panel. I mean, we've got this thing of the debate about whether normality really has returned the question about um, conspiracies. I think as well, the panel might, I mean, I, I feel like there's a couple of the panelists who maybe want to pick up on each other's points as well, whether it's a, a criticism that was made by Matt about this obsession with newness or other things that have been talked about. And just to throw my own two cents into there as well, it's that, I mean, one of the ways you which I find it very persuasive to look at the rise of apocalyptic thinking is not as a sort of coherent response to something, but as an ideology that fits very well an elite that can no longer do anything, can no longer can organize society. And so apocalyptic thinking becomes a way of reconciling ourselves to the fact that things are going to continue to get worse, but nobody can be held responsible for them. Um, so and, and anyone who wants to pick up on any of those three things? Uh, maybe, uh, Alex, I'll come to you first. Thanks for that, Jacob. Um, I absolutely agree with what you're saying, and it fits into the question, Alistair. Um, asked about his concern whether there's too much emphasis on this as a coherent outlook um, and I would agree with him, I don't think it is coherent um, I think it's a, a response to something uh, greater uh, better, better people than me have um, posed it like this, that it's an absolute, it's a response to an absolute collapse of moral authority so there is, we, somebody else says we live in interesting times. We live in times where, um, you know, certainly across the board, um, people are searching desperately um, to find a cohering force. That need not be a bad thing, you know, uh, just like ideology. Ideology need not be a bad thing to be sure, to be certain. Um, and to drive forward, there's not a bad thing. Um, so I, I think that's a, you know, probably another salon in and of its, uh, 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 itself. And um, just another thing, um, you know, the question of solidarity that um, I think it was Beverly that raised it. Um, um, indeed, why um, um, solid? I don't think solidarity is based on morality. I think it is based on self self interest and the best kind of self interest. Because if you worry or are concerned about your needs, it won't take that long to realise that you know the needs of other um, 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 don't conflict, but indeed um, strengthen um, your self interest. Great, thanks, Alex. Uh, Russell, maybe I'll come to you next. 
Yeah, I, I would agree with your point actually the most about about this apocalypticism, which I did practice saying a lot before this. Um, that that is kind of a way of just saying like you know it can't be helped, right? It was it was just fate. It was going to happen, and and our dithering, our, our not you know taking control of a situation, or even providing an argument that others can argue against, um, you know, can happen. We're just kind of sliding through life here. Um, so I I do agree with you there. Um, regarding the coherence or not of this. Um, yeah, I don't think it's like coherent per se. I just think like this kind of performative apocalypticism is a kind of deflection strategy. I don't think people need to even consciously think that through. There's just this kind of idea, you know, people are suffering, especially if you look at the United States. It's like poor people are suffering, working class people are suffering. So for upper middle class people in the US, which is like pretty rich people, actually, um, they're just like, you know, yeah, we're suffering too, right? I mean, we're all suffering and I'm suffering too. So I'm not the enemy here. I'm a sufferer with you, right? So I think that's just kind of almost like an unconscious thing that people try to put themselves in that position and to kind of join this kind of victim group rather than being potentially... I guess, part of the problem, which they really don't want to be, and they don't want to believe about themselves either. Um, that kind of, I think, hits on one more point I would make, which is that a lot of things in people's brains don't happen at a conscious level, they happen at an unconscious level. And the way our brains have developed, you know, we, we have drives that have developed evolutionarily, you could say. Um, and some of those drives are to like expand and to grow and to have a purpose in life, right? Um, and that's in a way where all of this is coming from. So uh, regarding what Matt said before about, you know, oh, there's this like, you know, brand new future, future going into space or something. I don't think that's the case. I don't think anyone's trying to make that case. Um, but people went to North America, you know, people went to Australia in canoes, apparently. Like those things were even probably more dangerous than going to space. But, you know, people have always expanded. People have always looked for something more. People have always looked for a purpose. If they don't get that, you know, if enough people don't get that for a long enough time, things get really nasty. That's where things start to turn inward again. You know, your energy needs to go outward, it turns inward. If it turns inward, that's like depression and nihilism, right? And that's what's happening to us as a society. We're not turning our our focus outward to challenges, whatever those would be. Like, you know, it doesn't have to be anything specific. We're turning it inward. And that's why we're like, you know, fighting each other to the death, kind of. Great. Thanks, uh, Rosa. I mean, maybe Josie, that leads on nicely to you. And I mean, at the beginning, especially, we were talking about the need to find something new or to the possibilities of new beginnings. Um, and also, I guess, as well, those, uh, I guess, implicit challenges about the degree to which has normality returned. But of course, anything you want to pick up? Sure, sure. Um, I mean, definitely hasn't returned in France. I mean, <laughs> it's, uh, it's feeling more and more like um, like the occupation, to be honest. Um, and very much has the same the same kind of feeling of of um, collaboration and resistance and that kind of thing. Um, I mean, I think I agreed with Rosie and Jeff about um, there is something revolutionary about ordinariness, about ordinary social contact. And you know, you go into a shop and they're not wearing a mask, and you don't wear a mask because masks are required by door still. And there's just something nice and positive. And you appreciate that relationship, that face-to-face -face in a way you never did. It sort of allows you to rediscover other people. Um, you know, when you go to a cafe, they don't check your past, then actually that it allows you to rediscover that social relation. So you kind of, I think there is something revolutionary about just those ordinary social contacts and that are done outside of official lines. Um, living normally has become revolutionary in these circumstances. Um, so the thing I should have mentioned about French populism is there is one guy who's actually, his name's uh, Florian Philippot, and he's um, actually using the vaccine passports for a, what he calls for a revolutionary transformation of French society <laughs> in the sense of the, the re- placing of the people at the heart of sovereignty again. So he's, he's Frexit um, um, against the olig oligarchy. So he's basically using vaccine passports as a complete rebellion against the oligarchy. And I mean, he's, he's a great rabble rouser. So he does these amazing kind of speeches from platforms where he's kind of waving his book. He looks like something out of, you know, Russian revolution or something. Um, and he, you know, but he, he's standing for president, but isn't gonna win, but um, is, is, is a, is, is a very kind of positive figure. Um, when I asked this question about whether it's a conscious effort, I mean, I think, no, I think there are various blueprints. Um, I mean, I think the left actually produced the blueprints for COVID in a way. 
so I mean, for environmentalism and for response to COVID, there are various books um, where people say, this is an opportunity and we need to do this, that, and this for this reason. So we had, I think it was, what's his name? Benjamin, Benjamin Bratton or something, the, the, um, the Revenge of the Real guy, um, uh, Badiou in, Fran in France, basically saying, this is nature um, coming back and we need to use this moment to transform the international capitalist system in this way, that way, that way. So in a way, these are, these are the blueprints. They, might be, they may be kind of World Bank blueprints. I know that there are various kind of COVID, whatever, you know, projects. Um, but I think largely it's not that. I mean, I think largely it's, it's, um, it's, the, it's the state responding to various contradictions and absences. Um, and doing that unconsciously. And so you have something like a virus and that appears in their head as um, the virus is the embodiment of the people almost or free, the free people. And so almost like every, throughout COVID, every act of suppression was given the meaning of a prophylaxis of, of an anti-viral measure, whether or not it did anything to stop the virus, but almost every form of restriction was seen as, um, as anti-COVID. Yeah. So restricting the people was restricting the virus, right? So something about the political circumstances meant the virus appeared in this form in their heads and these po policies had a logic. And so now whenever viral rates rise, they have to impose a restriction of, of some kind. It doesn't matter how you use it is, how pointless, there has to be a restriction in response to viral um, measures because that has become the logic of the politics. So I think it's almost entirely unconscious and dealing with phant phantasms. But it, what is playing out are objective contradictions and predicaments, which means that there is an overall logic to the measures they're taking over time. And these, this, is, you know, this is a logic that I've seen over the last 10 years campaigning on civil liberties issues and the forms taken by state officialdom have been writ large um, in a kind of absolutist form with COVID measures. But the logic was there 10 years ago. So I think the, the logic is playing out, but it's not conscious. It's a response to um, contradictions, the detachment of the state from society, detachment of people from one another, and, and the, the, you know their kind of um, experience of one another as a as a threat. Um, Great. But it's not it's not a blueprint as such. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks, uh, Josie. Uh, Matt, uh, some quick thoughts. Then we'll then we'll definitely come back out. Yeah, I think it's actually where I want to come in actually does tie in quite well with what Josie was saying. And it's, again, on the issue of coherence. And I think we should, of course, distinguish between two types of coherence. There's the coherence of the logic that's underpinning a lot of this, and then there's the coherence of uh, political parties and governments' implementation of that logic. And on the latter, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of lot of madness and a lot of folly. But on the former, I think there is actually a striking coherence amongst different political communities. And I think there's a very, for me, a very clear logic underlying a lot of this. And it's the logic of the logic of survival and management. Uh, it seeks to implement a very particular conception of what it means to live a good life. And at the moment, it's a very evacuated, shallow and empty conception of the good life, which is keeping people alive as long as they can. The, lo the logic, the policy with that was implemented here was in terms of lives and livelihoods, which just means uh, lives now or lives later. Uh, and I think a similar policy has been implemented abroad. And I think what's very striking about uh, the, 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 the reach of this, this, this coherence or this, this ideology that's manifested over the course of the last few years is how much it infects even our ordinary ways of thinking. Even, for example, the idea of back to normal, I think implicitly assumes within it the very Agamben, oh, and I can't pronounce it either, Agamben distinction between the state of exception and normality. There's a kind of elastic notion of what political life is like. There's, oh, when cases are rising and when the death numbers are high and the NHS for you is under constraint, and then we can go back to normal. But the idea that po politics itself should be constituted by the normal, and I, can't, I forget who said it, but I really like the term of revolutionary normality. And that's the point that I was trying to adjust right earlier, is rather than conceiving of politics as this dichotomous or this division between the state of exception and then going back to normal, we should rather import into our politics the normal itself. When we want to do politics, we should not say, oh, there's the pub down there. The pub should be in the heart of politics because that's what matters. It's going to the pub. It's not having to wear an orange armband 
just whether you want to know you want to fist pump someone. It's, it's situating those ordinary local forms of solidarity in the very heart of politics. That's not what happens when politics ends. That is politics. And it's, I just found it quite striking that, and I'm, I'm not necessarily suggesting the question is with, with, with trying to say this, but a lot, of what, a lot of what the question seemed to assume to me was precisely this division what, of what's the political and then what's the normal. The political is the normal. Great. Uh, thanks for that, Matt. Okay, let's the, the, come out. Anyone else who wants to speak, um, do put your hand up as well and, and get stuck in because this will probably be the, the last round of questions we'll do. So, But plenty of time to take everyone, but do just put your hand up so we make sure we get you all right in the chat. Um, Mo. Thanks, Jacob. Um, I think my point might follow on a little bit from Matt's, actually. Um, I've really appreciated everything uh, all four speakers have had to say tonight about this kind of apocalyptic thinking as a cohering force in the absence of social solidarity. But what I've been getting quite um, obsessed with, I suppose, is there have been two cohering ideas permeating through society before the pandemic and certainly during the pandemic. And, and one you would say is identity politics, of which its proponents are often referred to as woke. The other um, uh, kind of cohering idea that um, frustrates me more than I can tell you is the kind of conspiratorial theory, which actually does end up in a kind of great reset, but it, it, it's a kind of wanting to um, avoid the great reset that they believe has been planned for us. And those people uh, describe themselves as being awake. And it strikes me there's something sim similar between in these things about being woke to the true nature of racial injustice or social injustice in some way, um, as opposed to everybody else who is asleep. And the same with the awake people, um, you know, the um, smiley faces, uh, flowers. They say that they are awake to what this, what the um, elites have got, what the World Economic Forum have got all planned for us in the future. They're truly awake and everybody else are sheeple who are, are, are kind of asleep or they're not fully enlightened to, the, to what's actually going on. And I think there's something similar in those in that they will quite often present um, a, a, a problem that only they can see that isn't related to the, what is actually materially happening in society. And then you could say the same with the, the awake crowd as well. And uh, yeah, I, I suppose I'm just, this is just something that's been kind of um, obsessing my mind a little bit that it does have a cohering force because people are getting together they're having meetings on zoom they're going to protest not the only protesters but they are um part of that protest movement um and it's not related to anything that's in it's almost like an invented problem to which they have they have seen the light although they don't offer any positive vision and both the walk and the awake have got quite a nihilistic view but they also kind of create a tribal tension between themselves who are awake and, and the rest of society who doesn't quite get it. So I just wanted to throw that out there and see what the speakers thought of that. Great, thanks, Mo. Uh, Rachel? Um, yeah, just to follow on from what Mo said, I think, yeah, I've, I've also thought about those words, wake, uh, sorry, awake and woke, and, um, you know, this idea of being conscious I've noticed that word being used um, amongst people who would sort of see themselves as eco-friendly, um, you know, nice people. Um, but that's not my main point. I'm really interested in what uh, Josie and well, all the speakers said, but uh, Josie said uh, living normally is a revolutionary act. And uh, I think Matt said the political is um, is not being the political is the normal or the normal is the political. Um, so the. One thing that I um, noticed when I looked at the coverage of um, the protests in Vienna against mandatory vaccinations, um, you know, one thing for me is that just the idea of that, the, la the loss of bodily autonomy um, for people coming soon is incredibly shocking. And um, there was one banner that people were holding up, which said, uh, European friends, please help us. And uh, whilst I acknowledge, uh, as Jeff said, that, you know, the UK at the, or England at the moment is not quite at that stage. Um, I think it's time for us to really think internationally, um, globally about this issue, um, because obviously other societies are living through all kinds of um, bizarre restrictions you know Australia for example or 
actually there is already mandatory vaccinations in Indonesia. And, um, you know, it's, it is a point in time when these events around us are moving so fast that, um, you know, it's, it's not, I think, yeah, live, live normally, you know, that resist the new abnormal, um, you know, try to live as normally as possible, but it requires much more than that. And I think on a personal level, um, you know, what's the opposite of fear? It's courage. Uh, these are the things, you know, we actually have to embrace on a daily basis, um, but also build more than that. And um, the other thing I feel is that because the things like um, imposing mandatory vaccinations, these are very blunt measures. And so I think that is why we see the outbursts. But also I th the uh, positive side of that is that um, they're so blunt that I think more people are going to be responding and saying, hang on, you know, this is this really is a step too far. And uh, so I personally feel that arguing for bodily autonomy is uh, an extremely important point. Great, thanks a lot for that. I, I, and certainly, I think to pick up on one of the things we definitely want to do with these international summits going forward is forge that kind of sense of uh, international uh, connection and thinking internationally. I mean, towards the beginning of the panic, the economist Branko Milanovic said, uh, noted that the coronavirus is like one of the first, really, in honestly, one of the first truly global phenomenons that made even the world wars look kind of parochial by comparison. And yet at the same time, my, and I think many other people's experience of this has been an intensive sense that things are very different in very country, in different countries. And that contradiction between something that's affected the whole world and how it seems to be experienced even more intensely differently in different countries is something we should definitely set ourselves the task of trying to unpick and uh, 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 trying to put right. Uh, uh, Dominic. Well, on that theme, speaking to you from Italy, I wanted to touch on some of the commonalities uh, in this theme, but also some of the profound international differences. So I agree with a lot of the speakers that particularly on the issues around the environment and the culture of fear, there's a lot in common between Europe, the US, South Africa, and the UK. But I think there's quite a big difference in the UK from some of those other countries. Uh, having spent a few weeks in the UK over the summer and then returning to Italy, as some of the speakers have said, there did seem to be a move towards more normalcy around COVID-19 in the UK. And I wonder whether to some extent that's because the question of kind of populism was temporarily and maybe superficially put to one side in the UK with the Brexit vote. So I feel in the UK, you don't have the same kind of polarization anymore. Yes, I know there are still some demos uh, England. I know there are questions around vaccine passports, but we don't see the same kind of polarization in the UK that we continue to see in the US, in South Africa, in Australia, and particularly in many European nations. So I think particularly within the European context, I wonder whether that polarization is still very much due to the lack of the resolution around populism. We know that, you know, in France, in Spain, in Austria, Belgium and Italy, there continue to be these demonstrations and distinctions between people. Richard used the word, it's the conspiracy theorists that are a problem. In many European countries, it's now the anti-vaxxers who are seen as the problem. And maybe they're seen also as the people who might have been more populist and maybe sometimes uh, being anti-vax is the form that being anti-establishment government is taking. Now, I agree with Josie's points that the protests we've seen have uh, not developed a real collective spirit, and also Alex made that point very clearly. I think it's quite stunning that the huge demonstrations in Austria were followed by the lockdown yesterday, that all those people just went back into their homes uh, and back into private life. But I don't think, um, although no new kind of collective has developed, I do think there are big problems and uh, groups of resistance building up in countries like France, uh, in Italy and in Belgium. 
And I think this is going to develop, particularly because of the policies that are being uh, put forward by European governments, distinguishing between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. I hope everybody has noticed that the Austrian lockdown is for 20 days for everybody, and then will continue for the unvaccinated. What will happen to them? In Italy yesterday, uh, the Italian uh, government and today the cabinet have been uh, discussing introducing a super vaccination pass. That will go beyond the part of the moment which people are aware is basically you need to work uh, or you need to have um, negative tests. The super pass that they are going to bring in will distinguish between basically everybody will be able to go to work uh, but the unvaccinated will be no longer be able to go to restaurants, bars, cafes, theatres, etc. One cabinet minister put it today, the unvaccinated will be able to work, stay home and watch TV. Now, although I agree that there haven't been uh, big new collectives, I think that many elites in Europe, particularly in Austria, Belgium, France and Italy, are very concerned about the resistance and the lack of control they have uh, over many of the protests that have been developing. So I do think there is a space there to consider how those responses will develop. Now, I agree with Josie that there doesn't seem to be any kind of political coherence to those responses. Uh, nevertheless, I think that because the populism question hasn't really been resolved in Europe, uh, there is scope for this to run. Great. Th thanks for that, Dominic. That was, a, that was really comprehensive and very helpful. Um, and, and good, as, as again, as I keep saying about this, to get the perspectives from different countries and what's going on there. Um, if, if there's no one else who'd like to come in, then I, I think we can probably wrap. So I'll, I'll hand over in a sec to uh, Josie. We'll do the order in which we started to uh, wrap up some thoughts. I did have one question come in on the chat asking, I mean, as in these kind of situations the, and conversations, uh, a, a natural question is, well, should, what, what, what do we take from this? What should we go out and do? What causes should we throw our weight behind? What, what can we do to kind of try and reestablish some sense of normality and, that's, or, or, and challenge the broader culture of fear and the, the ways that that's going to be used going forward? A very helpful question, I think. I will say before I hand over to the speakers to wrap up, though, that um, one thing, hopefully you'll be familiar with one thing the Academy of Ideas has been trying to do over this period, not just returning to normal life and having the Battle of Ideas Festival and organising these Zoom debates, but also providing an opportunity for people to think through these issues in print and to use those things in print to pass around and, and discuss. And so I do want to direct your attention to that. I mean, myself, lucky enough to, but also, also uh, Rosalind and in one of the forthcoming ones, Josie have written in our Letters on Liberty series. Um, and so I do urge you, I mean, check out the website. Someone will drop it in the chat in a sec, but please, I mean, they make great Christmas presents to say the least. And this is an international salon, but our international shipping rates are very, uh, very competitive. So you, don't, don't, don't feel like we're going to rinse you dry just because you need to ship it halfway across the world. But we'd love to get them out there. We'd love you to buy them, pass them on, use them to start a conversation. Um, maybe not over the dinner table with your relatives, but uh, certainly use them to start a conversation with friends in the pub and all the rest of it. Um, but for, for now, let, let's, let's head over to our uh, panelists and we'll have some closing thoughts. So Josie, your closing thoughts. You know, I think that the difference that's developing between the UK and EU is very much to do with Brexit. I think that European elites are talking to each other. And so you had Austria announcing the lockdown for the unvaccinated. You had like three other European countries doing the same thing within a day. They're talking to each other. And now in France, everyone, the day after on the TV, they're asking ministers, are we going to lock down the unvaccinated? So it's these policies, they spread like wildfire across the European Union because these elites are, are kind of collaborating in that respect. I mean, I think it, it is a, a kind of dark time in the sense that, you know, the, the, the degree of coercion that is currently existing and that is anticipated um, is phenomenal. I mean, you really do feel this kind of like, this looming kind of uh, specter over the winter and you know that nothing is off the table. Um, I mean, I think that's even in the UK, nothing is off the table. I think that, you know, it may feel normal, but it can all be taken away tomorrow. And so that's reality. But I mean, I think, um, you know, because they don't need to go through Parliament, they can just write a statutory instrument and that's all, that's it, right, job done. Um, and that, if they bring through vaccine passports, that's, that will be how they do it. They'll just do a statutory instrument, it'll be law the next day, you know, that'll be it. Um, 
On the other hand, I think it's a very exciting time. I think, you know, you can't but watch those thousands of people in Rome with their mobile phones in the air shouting. And it's just a phenomenal sight, you know? It's just, um, and I think that the, 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 there is the willingness of people to stand up is there and is, is, is tremendous. And I think that the more these repressive, me repressive measures develop and certainly in Europe it feels like they are um dark things can happen but then you see the crowds and it, it is uh, that's a wonderful sight and I think that those um there is a substantial courage people willing to give up their jobs to resign to to um you know in Italy I thought you have to have be vaccinated to work and they've obviously changed that but um you know, I think that the people's willingness to take to take risks to challenge these things is phenomenal. And so I, I always watch these videos on and go to as many as I can, and it, they're always very uplifting. So I, mean, I think I very much agree with Rachel um, that the question is courage. I think I wouldn't be optimistic about the future. I'd be courageous. I think that's the thing. It's like you have to be willing to put yourself out there and to take risks and to go to a demo, if you're not supposed to be there and to get arrested or whatever it is you're going to do. Because I think that certainly in Europe, there is a very much a feeling that, you know, that things are going to are, are already extremely bad. I mean, and you know, everything, nothing is off the table in terms of what can happen over the winter. So, I think that courage is probably the best virtue rather than optimism in these circumstances. Sorry, that was my most inappropriately timed sneeze. Um, uh, Rosie, uh, thank you. I mean, that, 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 uh, gladly I managed to uh, mute it, but it would have served as, as, as something of a, as, of, a, of a round of applause anyway, or at least a noise to indicate. Um, Thanks. That was a really great way to end. Um, Alex, over to you. Uh, okay. Can I first thank Rosie? Who knew going to the pub was revolutionary? I'm delighted. Thank you. Um, okay. So I find um, so many conflicting issues um, rise to the surface, um, and it's difficult to... Um, you know, get a grip on how one might respond to them. Um, and for me, what I find useful is whatever that issue might be, well, whether it's Brexit, environmentalism, woke, any of that kind of stuff, I ask myself the question, at its core, what is this saying about people? And any issue that holds people, the public, and utter contempt, which is not difficult to work out, then I'll critique and run a million miles away from. Um, the other question is, which is maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm just a dog with a bone, does it generate a sense of solidarity? Because I still think this is a crucial question um, for us at this particular moment for kind of two reasons that are connected. One is, Solidarity, a sense of commonality, a sense of togetherness is the best defense against reactionary ideas. But it's also the springboard for any potential radical opening up of democratic forms. So we here <laughs> might know how, oh, how do we go and build uh, new networks of solidarity, but we certainly can cheer them on we can, we can identify them and celebrate them. Um, and, and I would suggest we might do that by asking the question, as I say first, what does it say about the public? What does it say about people? Great, thanks, Alex. Uh, again, a, re a really useful uh, few reflections to end on. Uh, Rosalind, some final thoughts. Yeah, I, I think the common thing here is really these two poles of democracy and the rule of law. So there's like been a lot of talk about like the collective and the individual in the chat, I guess as, as long as we live in a society, we are all part of a collective one way or another if we want to be or not, because we can't completely escape each other. We can't escape being affected by each other. But the question is how we go about making those decisions with each other. Um, I think what gets a lot of people about the entire uh, pandemic situation is that you know decisions have been made, they've been unmade, they've been made again, they've gone around and around 50 different times. Um, there hasn't been a lot of clarity about why we're doing what we're doing, um, for one thing. Um, and I, I don't think there's a there's a 
clear idea of what we're heading that way. And we also haven't really involved people because most places don't, most countries don't involve their citizens on a daily basis in decisions that just tell you what you have to do, right? Um, so I think that's probably really at the root of it all is kind of how do we make decisions collectively, but then at the same time, once a decision is made, how do we stick with it, right? I mean, if you have people going around and doing whatever they feel like, you also won't achieve anything, right? We all have to abide by the laws as they're made. So I think this is kind of at the core of it. Um, I do think that as far as mandatory vaccination goes, um, I'd be very surprised if that got through at court um, in Germany and probably in Austria too. I don't know as much about Austrian law, but the corp uh, bodily integrity is you know, a very, very important component of law. So I can see that definitely being constitutionally challenged. I mean, that comes in in all kinds of legal cases that you can't do uh, order medical treatment like you know, you can maybe coerce it a bit and preventing people from, you know, maybe going to a public school or something like that. But to actually physically force someone to have an operation, I think would be very, very, very difficult legally. So um, I think to some extent, there are also already protections that we're not totally, um, you know, focused on all of the time, you know, and kind of just going back and forth between these wild positions um, to do nothing or to do things that aren't necessarily effective um, or there's not necessarily an explanation for it. Um, but yeah, I think that's the main point, is the point of having a democracy where people are involved in the decision making and with involved, I don't mean just superficially involved, I mean really involved in that. Great, thanks, uh, uh, Rosalind. Um, and yeah, the, uh, as, yeah so the involvement of people in democracy and also using the law where, where we can, two very useful points to take forward. Um, Matt, uh, your final thoughts then? Sure, I'll, I'll just try to end up with maybe from where we started. Um, when we're trying to deal with big problems or, or rather problems ranging from COVID to climate change. And if we want to avoid the kind of apocalyptic thinking that seems to structure so much of our discourse, I think we need to avoid uh, two words that actually Dominic brought up in his, in his question in the context of social forms when he spoke about big and new. I think we should be on guard whenever we encounter those sorts of, those sorts of uh, structuring terms. I think we should avoid big for the very reason that Rob brought up in the, on the chat, for the idea of, uh, of false consciousness or being woke and waking up or opening men's eyes. The, the, the irony behind that kind of thinking or that kind of discourse is that it's usually said by people with big ideas of their own, where the consequence of the grandness of that idea is blind us to the other uh, smaller and often uh, equally important things. Uh, when we're trying to deal with these problems that we face, it's, there's no grand solutions, there's no big as uh, 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 the big one side, one shoe fits all solution to these problems. It's smaller things that are how we go about fixing them. And the other, the other problem is the idea of new. And I think that's pro problematic for two reasons. Um, one is the one that I try to bring up, which is that so much of that, so much of what matters in our lives, like family and love and friendship and the pub and our sports teams, those aren't new. Those are a consequence of old social formations, and it's precisely the preservation and the conservation of those old formations through which we can live lives of meaning and value. And the emphasis on newness tends to obscure that. And the second reason I think we should sometimes be cautious about the new is that it blinds us to the lessons of the past where we've confronted similar issues. Uh, and it's precisely our imagination or our presumption that what we confront in the present is somehow radically different, that we so somehow search for something entirely new, when perhaps we might have solutions that already exist in the past. Great, thanks a lot, Matt. Um, really, really, really useful. Um, but also, I mean, to all four of our speakers, thanks so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, uh, thing. The only thing that doesn't work, we've had a great conversation tonight. The only thing that doesn't work at all is uh, uh, congratulating you and saying thank you and a warm round of applause. And then, of course, being able to carry the conversation on over over a pint afterwards. But um, nonetheless, it has been great to spend the evening with you all. Uh, I've really enjoyed that. Well, we're if. If you guys think this work, you can send us an email or something or get in touch and say we'd like to carry on these discussions. As I said, the one thing that could be useful is having a forum for those of us who are kind of scattered in different places um, across the world to come together and make sense of things as they're happening. So if you guys listening in found that useful, please let us know and we'll, we'll, we'll definitely look at what we can do next and what topic we can tackle next. As I say, do pick up some Letters on Liberty. They make great Christmas gifts. If you've enjoyed this, it'll be your first um, Academy of Ideas event, please subscribe to the main list. You can also head to academyofideas.org.uk slash donate for any of you who want to give um, any amount, big or small, to help support the work of the Academy of Ideas and carry on 
organizing events such as these. But I mean, I think it's now time for me to say thanks so much for all your contributions tonight. I really enjoyed that. Have have a great evening.